We can win this war. We can win this war? OK, well, joining us from Orlando, Florida, is the man in that clip, Anthony Dream Johnson, who says he wants to abolish feminism and make women great again. No, but it also crazy. says, with a trademark, make women great again for women. Always, always great. great. Right. Make women great again. But they're going to do a three-day seminar for women led by all men. <laughs> in mansplaining news, a three-day conference for women led by men hopes to make women great again. How the 22 convention will make you the greatest you ever. Raise your femininity by 500%. First of all, how is a man supposed to tell a woman how to be the ultimate woman? Well, women need to be taught how to be great again. Oh, not my yes, words. We do. Not like my... how to land a husband, <gasps> how to lose weight, how to pop out a bunch of kids. Why do men think they need to fix the problems of women? Well, it says the world's ultimate event for women. Yeah, Orlando, Florida, that's going to be the scene of the crime. It's mansplaining palooza and say no to the toxic, bullying, feminist dogma. <laughs> Taught by men to make women great again. Taking the stage now is the founder of the 22 Convention. You're in for a treat, Mr. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. The first president of the Manosphere. It's run by all men, Surprise. which promises to, quote, make women great again. This course is guaranteed to raise your femininity by 500%. Together, we will make women great again. Excuse me, I'm mansplaining here. She said there's nothing... Boom. Welcome back to the 22 convention, Make Women Great Again, 2021 of Orlando, Florida, being held for the second time ever at the 15-year anniversary of 21 Studios and 21 Summit. Our next two speakers, uh, one of them is actually a returning speaker to the 22 convention from last year, gave an awesome speech called Make Women Wives Again. Love it. Go check it out on YouTube, our channel, and his own, Elliot Hulse. And his wife is actually a new speaker to the event. And together, together today, they're going to be doing Q&A. So you might have heard of the Brady Bunch, but now you're going to get to see the Hulse's Bunch <laughs> with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hulse. So without further ado, please and welcome to the stage of the 22 Convention, Elliot Hulse and his beautiful wife, Colleen Hulse. Welcome. Yep, there you go. Thank you. Elliot, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having us. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here on the stage with my wife. And I'd like to provide some context for why a Q&A or a conversation with us might be unique. Uh, I am a YouTube celebrity, I guess you could say. A lot of people follow me for fitness, but as well as for life advice. And a lot of young men come to me with regard to challenges with the women in their lives. And some of the things that I say are quite challenging to the current paradigm of gynocentrism. And so, when I give answers to the questions that aren't as savory as most women would appreciate, I get a lot of f feedback or flack that sounds a lot like, what does your wife think of that, Elliot? <laughs> she must have left you. Or, better yet, your wife must be an oppressed woman. <laughs> All right? So, of course, none of that's true. but. For us to be who we are and to have gotten where we are so that we have what I refer to as a traditional marriage and family, uh, as traditional as you can get in this postmodern age, uh, I'd like to just back up a few decades to where she and I met in high school. And so we have been together since we were 14 years old, uh, dating through high school, dating through college, and then got married at age 22 started having children at age 23. She w became a, uh, well, had our children at home, so natural childbirth, home birthing, uh, as well as nursing our children, kind of rebellious, unique things in a day like this. Uh, homeschooling our children is kind of a new thing that we're doing right now. And so we've had a successful marriage for a number of different reasons. One of which I believe is because we got together early and we avoided the promiscuous party ages uh, that kind of destroy, or as 
uh, Lori Alexander says, fornication pollutes your future marriage bed. And so we were, we were saved from that by the grace of God, uh, as well as just how we relate to one another. And so last year I gave a talk titled Make Women Wives Again, and it was based on a question that I was given by a young lady who follows me that went a little something like, Elliot, what are some of the tips that you would give to young women that would allow them to be in a relationship like you are with your wife? And so if you bear with me for a moment, I'm just going to go over a few of the points that I made at that talk. And then I would love to open the conversation up for you to ask any questions or have a dialogue with us uh, related to you know, how this may be applicable in the lives of many. Because I believe that making marriage great again, making family great again, uh, is paramount to making our world great again. So the question goes, hey, Elliot, I know your channel is geared towards men, albeit oftentimes where there's a great man, there's a great woman supporting him. What are the top four qualities you appreciate about your wife that young women as myself can grow and develop? Now, I've developed this into a blog post you can also go see, or you can just go to the 21 Convention YouTube channel and watch my talk, Make Wives Great Again. But briefly, number one, Colleen appreciates when I make decisions. She likes to follow my lead. There's no oppressor oppression going on. There's more of a, a respect and love. And in that way, and that dynamic, she appreciates when I step up and I don't act effeminate or, or choose to allow her, or choose to make her make the big decisions. Number two, Colleen never takes me for granted. It's very important. Uh, she, reminds, she even reminds our children to be grateful. Yesterday, they were coming home from a, a resort that they stayed at because we were in the area, and she FaceTimed me, and her and all the kids chimed in, thanks, Dad. Very important just to show that gratitude, and I appreciate that, and that's why I put it there. Colleen's content with little. Uh, we, we came from not much. We, built ourselves up from the dust, and there has never been pressure or expectation to keep up with the Joneses. Um, I've never felt that pressure from her, and that has been great. Uh, and then number four, uh, Colleen never becomes hysterical or argues with me, even if I'm wrong. And it doesn't mean she doesn't hold me accountable, but she doesn't put a, put a chain around my neck or hold it over my head like we've seen so many other couples in their, their wives do. Do you have anything that you would like to add to that? Or maybe even add to the conversation of what has allowed our relationship to, to flourish? Um, just adding on to that, I think that giving you the space from the time we were young until, until now to kind of evolve from that young man and show your, show your leadership and show your responsibility and to, to have a track record to give you those opportunities to make mistakes and grow from them. Um, just to kind of, to give you that space yeah. to, to go from a young man to, a, to who you are now. Um, I, I've seen in a lot of relationships women that kind of hold their men back and they kind of, they do put that chain on them and try to control them. and. Um, I have seen how giving you space is much more resourceful for, for our marriage, for our family, for our future, um, to kind of evolve. That's been super helpful yeah. for us. Well, what's unique is that we've been children together, we were teenagers together, young adults together, middle adults together, and hopefully grandparents sometime yeah. soon. Not too soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd love to open this up to you guys to help us uh, facilitate this conversation if you had any questions or concerns, input. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's a microphone right back there. Uh, Colleen, how did you, even though you're very young, how did you escape the bombastic female encouragement of the society? How did you escape the desire to control the role models around you um, and really, Elliot, this is for you too. How did you become a man that leads? Um, I know you met early, but 
still you were able to preserve yourselves in a hurricane of dysfunction, and how did you do it? I don't even know if you can answer that question. We had Elliot's parents as our role models from, again, we met when we were 14. Um, his mom, when I look at her, I see the perfect example of what a wife should be, what a mother should be. Um, the way she tended her home, the way she tended to her husband, the way she tended to her children. Um, she didn't always take care of herself first, which I, I learned from that, that you do need to take care of yourself as well. Um, but having her as an example is, is where I got my inspiration. From the minute I stepped foot in their house, I knew that this is what I wanted. Um, my high school essay, like when I was applying to college, was my role model and it was about his mother. Um, just seeing the type of family that was possible when you make certain choices and when you establish certain routines and certain roles, and it was really very eye-opening. I did not come from a great home, and being able to see his family and the way they worked, and there was dysfunction all around us on both sides of our families, um, and being able to I mean, we, I don't want to say we lived together from that young, but I pretty much started hanging out around his house at 14, so I very quickly became part of the family. And I saw that this is what I want. This is, it. and if I can follow what she did and make those types of choices and those types of sacrifices, then I very well may get this type of life. And we made some different choices, but a lot of the choices we made were right in line with how his parents raised him and, and their siblings. Yeah, I would agree uh, 100%. And my sentiment comes from the same place because, you know, I, again, as you allude to, I'm growing up in this world. And it's very easy to get swept away. And as you, Colleen, alluded to, you know, there are times where she had to step back and watch me grow up because I was a beta male, as was expected by the world for you know, maybe up into my mid-20s. And it was, again, the foundation of coming from a strong family. I was able to look at my father and see, OK, now it's taken me this long to realize he's right, and then to you know, follow in his footsteps the same way that Colleen followed in my mother's footsteps. So coming from a strong traditional family, my parents are from Belize. Um, I'm first generation American. And so they didn't get the, the, the public school indoctrination. They weren't privy to what's going on in the media and the music. They were immigrants trying to work their butts off to make something happen that they couldn't get in their other country. So uh, I was fortunate enough to be born into that family and fortunate enough to have brought my future wife into that family at a very young age. So we had a great example ahead of us. You alluded earlier to sacrifices that you had to make for your family and for yourself as a couple. And a lot of women these days, they don't want to make sacrifices or they're afraid of the word sacrifice itself as something that they'll lose out on. Describe what kind of sacrifices that you had made before that were actually beneficial in the long term for your relationship. Well, I'll start with um, when we were still living in New York, uh, we had a deposit on a home. We were going to be buying a house right around the corner from his parents' house when they decided um, they were going to be moving to Florida, and we found out we were pregnant. And we had to have a really difficult conversation about whether or not we were going to continue on and buy this house, and I was going to have to go back to work when the baby was six weeks old so that we could afford this house or if we were going to lose our deposit and allow me to stay home with our children. And from the time I was in college and I got to babysit for my cousin and all of her friends who were all stay-at-home moms, um, I had never been exposed to that concept before going away to college, um, we made a really difficult decision that we were going to keep me home and he was going to do whatever he had to do in order to make that work. Um, and over those next few months, we picked up, we moved to Florida, 
we stayed with his parents, and he worked seven days a week for two years, from six in the morning till 10 at night, working, 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 until we could get ourselves situated and start our family the way we really wanted to start our family, it was with me home with the baby. And um, that was really difficult. We didn't have money. We were talking about what we were going to do. Like once we you know, got into our first little house, what are we going to do if, if the electricity gets shut off? What are we going to do if we can't afford food? Like what are our priorities? But keeping me home with the kids was such a high priority for us that, and he worked so hard and incrementally we were able to, to move our way up and I look back at it now and I'm like, you know, we know it was by the grace of God that it all worked out, but, you know, I could have just gone back to work. I could have just put my kid in daycare and we could have just, you know, started our family that way, but it was that important to us that we, we, made, we made that sacrifice. And now looking back, I couldn't imagine not having been home with my kids. Now homeschooling them and, um, having those, those moments, those knowing that I was the one that fed them and nursed them and took care of them and provided that foundation for them, there's nothing that could have replaced that. Yeah. And so, you know, when you use the word sacrifice, that means that there's something that you're giving up. <coughs> you, might, you, you need to have something to sacrifice. And it's unique because we didn't have anything. There really was nothing to, to sacrifice in a way. So a lot of couples who get together, say, in their mid-20s or 30s, well, they already have their own bank accounts. They already have their own cars. They have their own careers. They have their own stuff. Maybe they have We had, I had nothing of my own. I had just left my parents' house. She had nothing of her own. So rather than, you know, you use the word sacrifice, and that makes a lot of sense, but we had, we had nothing to sacrifice except for time, love, attention, and commitment, and so I think that's a part of the reason why we were able to be so have such longevity in our relationship and, and to do so well because there was never this sense of well I'm giving up something here or she's giving up the potential for something there. It was like this is what's meant to be, and we're we're starting out at the bottom together, and so that was that's the way it began. You know, I had a similar experience when I was young. My, uh, in my early 20s, my, you know, my father was the dumbest person I'd ever met. And by the time I was 40, I couldn't believe how smart he'd gotten. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things he told me was, you know, uh, you, you need to be free to make mistakes and learn from them. Yeah, you know, he said there are three kinds of people, people that can learn from others, people that have to learn for themselves, and people that can't learn at all, right? He's like, be the first two, at least, right? You know, I've seen a lot of men in marriages where their wives don't let them make mistakes. And they, they have interpreted leadership to mean you never err. Right. <laughs> so that if you ever err, then you have no right to leadership. Right. Right? Can you discuss kind of how you dealt with that in your marriage and, and what advice you might give to young couples about that? Well, I think that's more for her because I make errors. He makes errors. <laughs> I, for me, I always go back to the fact that I am his wife, not his mother. My job is not to teach him. My job is not to discipline him. My job is not to, you know, slap him on the wrist when he does something wrong or makes a, an incorrect choice or a, a, a bad decision. My job is to support him, to encourage him, to give him any strength when he does not feel like he has enough. When, when, when he's feeling like, Uncertain to say, just make the choice. Whatever the choice is, make the choice, and it will be okay. I think letting him make the decisions, letting him make the, the big choices, knowing it comes from an intention of love and purity and um, 
just wanting good for our family, it, it gives him the opportunity to show himself, to show who he really is, to show where his heart is. And regardless of how those decisions come out, when you know it comes from a place of love and wanting good for our family, it, it doesn't really matter what the outcome is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A uh, few things I might add to that is that she was warned. I told her, life is going to be like a roller coaster. I know myself. And so there could be some tough times. There could be some rough times. There are going to be some great times. Um, I never promised a, a rose garden or, or, or a smooth, smooth ride. It was, hey, I'm going on this wild adventure. And I'm that kind of guy where I may make some decisions, some wrong decisions. But with that being said, making the wrong decision is not really the problem. It's about making that decision right. Mm -hmm. There have been a lot of times where, you know, maybe we're steering the, I'm steering the ship and it's not going exactly where we're supposed to go. And it's just a matter of, okay, I admit, I repent, I'm wrong. Let's turn things. Mm -hmm. But one thing for sure is she'll never rub it in my face or say I told you so or, or insist. She'll just quietly yield to my steering of the ship. And then even if I have to admit you were right and I got to turn around, still... Zip. Just keeps it, keeps it cool, keeps it quiet. And that gives me courage. That gives me courage to continue to make bold decisions, even if they don't turn out right. Uh, and the opportunity to rack up a good track record. Mm -hmm. Right? Like if you never give someone the freedom to have a track record, or you give them that one time and it's not perfect, you, how could you expect that person to grow and to flourish and to lead? So those are some of the things that I would add to that. Every opportunity is, is there to, to, show your, to show your strength, to show your courage, to show your right thinking. And each time you make a decision based on the goodness of our family, it, we, we wind up going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure, great, thank you. <laughs> Okay, last year, Colleen, Elliot told us a story about purchasing a vehicle, and um, <laughs> that would have been really hard for someone like me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I could have shut up. How, literally, can you take us through the nuts and bolts, the agony <laughs> of a man wanting something that seems silly? I'm sorry, Elliot. I, whatever. I remember sitting on the couch okay. in our old kitchen and him making the purchase, because you just buy the car online. And it was a Tesla X, and it was a lot of money that I didn't think we should be spending. <sighs> but I know how hard he worked over the 25 years, I guess, at that point we had been together. Um, and he doesn't spend frivolously on anything. He does not spend frivolously on clothes or shoes or events, sports, nothing. And we had just gotten a full home solar system. So everything in our home was run by the sun. And he wanted this Tesla. And although it, it did not make any sense to me, it gave me such joy to see how giddy he was when he got his Tesla and he plugged it into the, into the charger and we knew the sun was fueling this car, and he was giddy. And I don't really get to see him giddy very often. So for me, just <laughs> seeing how giddy he was and even making the purchase, it, it does not happen often. So for me, just getting to see that joy in him, and we had it for a year, and then we sold it because it was a silly purchase. But it was worth it to see, to see how, how giddy he got. <laughs> I would add that I think Colleen put more miles on that car than I did. Well, he let me drive it because I was driving the kids at that point to school many, like probably two hours a day I was driving and he was working from home at that yeah. point. So I was driving the car all over everywhere. So I enjoyed driving it. Yeah. She looked awesome in it. <laughs> I, made, I made it this color, right? So I got it plaster covered. I put this on it. 
And then on Christmas, I put a big red nose and re reindeer ears on it. Yeah. And she got to drive around, say, P, dropping the kids off of school. I'm like, look at my wife in my clown car. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. fast and fun, but. Yeah. And again, letting him see how silly that was on his own terms. Yeah. Uh, if I would have from the beginning said, that's a bad choice, that's a bad choice, don't do it, don't she do really it. And didn't then, say anything. Yeah, I didn't say anything. Zero. I think one time I said, I don't know if that's a good idea. I mean, we could be doing so much more with that money. And I think that's all I said. And I, I think that was the day you just pressed purchase. And... I think you, I mean, you learned your own lesson. I mean, it was fun, it was interesting, but it, I just let him learn his own lesson. Yeah, I think that's, I don't think that's unique to me. That's probably unique to all men. Like, you're not gonna teach me a lesson. I'm not your mother. You're not gonna teach me a lesson. I'm actually going to resist mm -hmm. if you try to teach me a lesson. You gotta get me room to mess up. Mm -hmm. That's just been the way I am in my entire life, and she seems to, you know me. Yeah. You know, so that's why it works. I know you also resist authority. So if there was some Whoa, kind of authority coming from your wife, no. you'd resist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey there. Did you want to ask a question or? No, I just Hi. I like your hairstyle. Yeah, well, you got spikes, I think I see. Uh, well, it's mo a, a mohawk. Fohawk, mohawk. Yeah, kind of like me. Thanks. <laughs> My mo. Hi. Hey there. Um, so I kind of wanted to know um, what you would tell younger people, uh, my age, I guess, 20 to 25, um, how to get into a traditional marriage. What would you say? I mean, we got daughters. We, we have, have daughters. daughters. Yeah, we have three daughters. And so we're kind of coming to this point. They're 17, 14, and 13. What do we tell them? I mean, we, we explain to them that it's your most important role, your most important opportunity is to be able to to raise your family, to have a family, and to raise your family. We haven't quite gotten to those conversations about how you're going to choose your husband. Um, but every day, I point to their father as an example of the type of man they will one day, hopefully, get to marry. I can't tell them where they're going to find that. Um, they don't go to school anymore, so they're not going to find them at school. We're not sending them to college, so they're not going to find them at college. I just continually point to their father. Don't settle. Hold your standards high. Set your expectation up front and be the kind of woman that the kind of man that you want is going to want as his wife. So really, the only thing you can do is, is control yourself. Make yourself the kind of woman, make yourself have the, have the kind of character that a man, when I look at my husband, that I think, okay, the kind of woman that he is going to want as his wife, how am I going to exemplify that? And he does really a really great job at pointing to me for how they should behave, for how they should grow, for how they should think, for how they should engage with the world. And you know, so I can't tell them where to go or, or how to find someone, but we can just be those examples for them. Yeah. Yeah. And the truth is that we didn't even know how we were getting here. We didn't know what we were doing. We had no clue, <laughs> really, by the grace of God. But with retrospect, I can re-engineer Right, work backwards and see. Okay, these are the things that work for she and I. These are the thing. These are the way she is and the way I am. And just by deductive reasoning, say to my children, "Well, look, this is what we did, and this is what we got. This is what your friends' parents did, and that's what they got. This is what your cousins' parents did, and that's what they got. 
And if you like what you see here with she and I and this family, then these are the things that we did, right? I'm not a genius, no one taught me this, but I look backwards and I say it worked out well. And so various things like skipping the whole promiscuous party stage. We really didn't have that because we were just with one another. I think that's huge for both men and women. I gave a long lecture yesterday about how we've got to stop fornicating. It seems like it's fun, but it only defiles your future marriage bed. Uh, so I bring that up now. Is that going, are they going to listen to me? I don't know. But I think it's my responsibility to say something. Getting married early, I think, is another really important one, key to what has allowed us to be who we are. We were investing in our relationship and our family in our early 20s when most of our friends were investing in bars and degeneracy, right? And you know, a beautiful thing about that that I always point to as well, because you know, everybody wants to have fun, right? What do you mean, you know, I want to have a fun life. She and I, given that word sacrifice, you could say, we gave our all from the time we were, you know, we got together at, or married at 22, uh, up through my mid-30s, maybe by 32, and then all of a sudden we had babysitters, and we, can kind, we kinda got a chance to, I don't wanna say relive our youth, but then we got to enjoy ourselves out there a little bit differently, but by then we were the elders. We were the, you know, the couple that all the young people that came to my gym look up to, and you know, they called us king and queen. And so it was a lot of fun. We didn't miss out on anything, in fact, I think it was better this way because if I were young and I were single, I probably would have done far dumber things than being an adult, being married, having family, and then going out and enjoying myself out there, out there with her. Uh, some other things that I think were important is that I don't understand the sterile relationship. I don't understand marriage without family. It, to me, it doesn't really make sense, and these people who uh, they wait and they wait and they wait and they wait. They wait to get married. It's like, yo, you've been together, living together for seven years. Then they wait to have kids. And I think that is a prolongation of immaturity. You, you, we were forced to grow up and start acting like adults at 23 years old because, well, I got a family. I got a wife and she's got babies to tend to. So I think that's another thing that was uh, instrumental to uh, our relationship and, and, and I can potentially use as guidance for my children. But once again, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I find you to be very manly. <laughs> you find me to be manly. Manly. You're very manly. Mm -hmm. And there are they who are out there who have no idea what being a man is about. They don't. So, you use the phrase, in the grace of God. I feel that for me, what I married, I have a traditional marriage. I haven't worked since I got married. I have never had a maternal drive. I never wanted kids. I think that's okay. Was I all about career? <sighs> yeah. But I also didn't have any, some women have this insatiable, <gasps> have to have a baby. For me, I, I never felt it. So anyway, um, as I said to you, I do have a traditional marriage. Mm -hmm. My husband travels internationally all the time. <laughs> and so I am by myself a lot. I am, but I also want for uh, when Doug comes home, nothing's changed. He's been gone six weeks. I had to learn that. I had to learn that, um, that I just have to let it be. It's not, oh, I, I have a beautiful home, lovely, beautiful gardens. I work in the gardens. You know, I just have, I, I'm a princess. I am. So thank you for letting me share that. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, thank you for sharing. And thank you for your manliness. <laughs> I don't mean to make noise. I got married when I was 21 years old. And I was working. And then we got pregnant. And just before the baby was born, I left on maternity leave and never returned. And. Um, I stayed home with my children. I homeschooled. This is probably back before y'all were born. And I have lived with my same husband for 50 years this last October 1st. God bless. <laughs> That's amazing. He came home one day. I had two little kids, both in school. By the way, in public school, all my youngest got was last three times. So. We quit doing that and homeschooled our children after we went on the road. My husband came home and he goes, I'm quitting the company and we're selling this house. We had just finished renovating it, hadn't even had my first meal in my new dining room. <laughs> it was like, uh, we ate Kentucky Fried Chicken as we were packing. Um, and he moved me with no home to go to from Georgia to Phoenix. And um, my friend said, he just came home and said, we're moving, the house is for sale? Uh, yeah, he's the man. And that's what he wanted to do with his career. And he kept us up. I didn't work outside the home. I was a stay-at-home mom. And that's where a woman has to be. Are you willing to follow him to the ends of the earth if that's where he wants to go? Because he has worked in other countries. And you have to be willing to go wherever he went into contract engineering. No, you have no job security, period. They can say, we don't need you tomorrow, don't come in. And he calls home and he says, honey, grease the hitch, because you're living in a mobile home, of, uh, living in an RV, or we made the mistake of buying a house the first time. And then we went to living in an RV and we traveled the country. My kids grew up without a swing set, but they grew up touching the Liberty Bell instead of reading about it. They grew up going all over this country. They have traveled the world. And you can't know what great things are going to happen to you if you just shut up and let the man lead. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. I guess I would add to the conversation about, you know, what are some of the elements that has allowed this to work is, and, and uh, advice to my daughters and children are that it's better for their mom not to work outside the home. I see absolutely no advantage for her to be working for another man, being a tax slave for the government, and then outsourcing the care of our children. It actually is mind-blowing to me that anybody would do that. And that's one of the pieces that I hold dear when speaking with particularly my daughters. You know, I, I, I don't want them to have to suffer, but I wish for them to have the same faith that you've had in mm -hmm. your husband and that she's had in me. I'm sorry to monopolize here, but I'm so curious by you, Colleen. I, I can't stand it because I drank the Kool-Aid and did the career thing and barely, thank God, God got me married at 43. So, so I'm untying a lot of whatever but how do you protect yourself from the myth of the glory of a career how do you stay focused or is it not even a temptation it's not even a temptation for me um, I said what well, I went I went away to college 
and I started babysitting for my cousin and all of her stay-at-home mom friends. And that kind of opened my eyes. And I finished my college career, and I went off, and I got my master's, and I got pregnant, and I said, I don't ever want to go back to work. I, I got pregnant my second week teaching middle school. I put in my resignation, and I never looked back. Um, I see my value in what I can provide for my, my husband, for my children, for my home, for my community. I don't feel my value would be increased. I don't feel like my, my confidence or my uh, who I am would be impacted positively at all should I decide to go back to teaching or go into nursing or go, go find a, you know, finding a career path working outside the home. I do find fulfilling that once our children were old enough that they were a little bit more self-sufficient that I could help my husband in our businesses. So being able to take on some responsibilities as an event planner for some of our, our camps or uh, so cu customer service or answering emails. And then I get to be a part of what he's doing. I, I got to see even more in depth what his vision was. You know, for a long time, he was in the business and I was with the family. And it was, you know, we were kind of walking parallel lives in the beginning when, you know, when our, our family first started. But as I was able to get more involved in the business, and now he's even helping with the homeschooling and, and doing, you know, Bible and PE with the homeschooling, our, our paths have kind of merged. And that's where I find we have the most value, where I have the most value, where I feel like I'm able to give my, my most. If I was working outside the home, I, 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 my heart wouldn't be in it. When I am working inside my home with my family, it's, it's seamless, it's easy, it's, I don't wanna say it's easy, it's not always easy, but it's, it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure. Thank you for that, Colleen, because um, I think a lot of women are curious about why I say I'm a homemaker, yeah. even though I do a lot of entrepreneurial things on the side. And we've lost the concept in our culture of homemaking as a vocation. Right. So I'd just like you to speak to that, because I have a lifestyle similar to yours. I help my husband with his businesses. I manage our investments. Um, I also do a little uh, publicity work on the side for things that we believe in as a couple. But home is my base, and it still allows me to do the two meals a day, two hot meals a day, which my husband really needs. He won't do a cold sandwich. He's got to have a hot meal. And uh, I find it very fulfilling. And I had a very long career at, in the business world. So please speak to homemaking as a vocation and the rewards of that. Or what you, do you see the need I do for more women to be inspired as homemakers? Absolutely. Um, so when I first started having babies, my whole world became babies and, and home. And I very smoothly fell into that role. At least I felt I very smoothly fell into that role. And I started realizing that not only was it my, what I was doing every day, I was actually enjoying it every day. Now, as the kids are older and we're schooling at home, I take, I take joy every day from waking up and making my children breakfast. I get joy from serving my husband lunch. I get joy from having a hot dinner on on the table for my family. I think women have been taught that those are just monotonous, boring tasks that should be shared between husband and wife. But I honestly feel that when I'm doing that, I'm pouring myself into it. 
when I'm cleaning up the house, when I'm driving the kids to sports, when I'm serving dinner, I feel like I'm able to give myself to my children, to my husband, to see when my kids and my, my husband come home and they, they feel warm and they feel loved and they feel safe. I feel like I am fulfilled when I, when I see that around me, when I look around my home and I know that everyone in my, in my home is happy and satisfied. I don't think there's any, any bigger goal for myself. I, I think women have been told that there's other more important things, like you know, climbing the corporate ladder. Um, that might be good for some. But if you want to have a family and you want to have a great marriage, there are certain things you can do that are going to get you there and get you there happily. And I, I really feel like what we've established, how we run our family, how we run our home, has brought so much fulfillment to me, to our, to our marriage, to our children, to our home, that I would just encourage women to at least consider it as a viable option, because not only is it a viable option, it is the most important opportunity that we're given to, to have strong marriages, to have children, to raise strong families. And that's, that's really the way that we're going to progress as a, as a culture, as a society, is if we turn back to our families, turn back to our relationships, turn back to our, our children, and, and really try to make it work. Hello. You used the word fulfilled. Oh, who doesn't want to be fulfilled? Mm -hmm. Some women find it in a career. Um, I think that it's, uh, that would be very challenging spiritually for me. Uh, <coughs> but some thrive through that. You have uh, been able to thrive through your commitment to your family. And it's a beautiful commitment. But also earlier, as I said, you used the word, by the grace of God. I truly feel that you have been graced by God. And I'm hoping everyone will come to a point in their lives where they understand and he, God is different for so many people. But I find a power, and I just, I just want to feel that power. So, you know, amen. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add, I like the fact that you brought up the word fulfilled, and I'm going to say something that maybe some people will have a hard time digesting, but as far as my wife and what I observe of women feeling fulfilled, that word is so perfect because you were filled full with babies in your belly. Mm -hmm. And so I think for women, again, I'm not one, but I can see how her life is, that a mental fulfillment, meaning maybe I'm attacking the world and I'm making big things happen through my head, or, or even an, an emotional fulfillment that, you know, th this man caters to me and, and loves me, I don't think it's complete without physical fulfillment. And so making babies, I think, makes women happy. Or fulfilled. Fulfilled. Filled full. <laughs> mm -hmm. I see a lot of, like, I like the term misplaced maternal instinct that ends up happening where, you know, if there are no children, then the, the focus then becomes, you know, something outside like the world. And so I guess that instinct to be maternal never really dies there regardless of if we turn it in or turn it out or you turn it in or turn it out like like um my friend there i never had a strong desire for children either and part of it was the broken home 
part of it is I had extended family with children with issues, medical issues like cerebral palsy and uh, retardation, and I had fear about it. Um, it's a big regret in my life that I didn't know more about natural childbirth and pain-free childbirth and things like that um, because I built the fear up so much that I lost that natural drive to have children. So I just want to share this for other women out there like us that decided early on that's not for me. Um, now I view the work I do for the community, you know, my, my mission field, what have you, as caring for all children of the world because I did make a mistake making that decision. And, but I do know it came from a broken place, a broken family that I was raised in where I didn't know if I could ever trust a husband to, to stay or a marriage to work. And I never wanted to be a single mom. You know, I just had issues around this. And feminism has actually promoted this attitude amongst women. They've made it feel optional to have children. And of course, the whole contraception uh, mentality um, is about making children a choice, not a, a part of nature. And when I got engaged to my husband, I said, do you want to have children? He said, it's just a part of life. And I received that from him. And our first year, we did try to have children, but it was too late for me. I had to have my ovaries removed a year after marriage, and it was no longer possible. Um, so I have made peace with that wrong choice, but um, I appreciate you sharing that it is normal and natural, and it is a very valuable part of a woman's life. And um, I don't have envy for my friends, but I have appreciation for my friends that have that wonderful aspect of their life. It's, I think it's a beautiful thing. Thank you for sharing that, because I think it's so important for older women, matriarchs, if you will, to say that to the younger girls, because there's a, been a, a, a subversion of their sexuality, and it oftentimes comes at the hands of their mothers and grandmothers, telling them, you know, go and do your thing, don't believe in or trust in any man, and wait until you can, you know, your eggs are about to rot. I don't know what, what it is, but there's this feminist tendency to tell the girls to be strong and independent as if that's somehow going to make their lives better rather than, hey, it's, it's great to be a, a wife and a, and a mother and, and have the home be your vocation. Thank you for, for sharing that so that we could stop the cycle. With the world as it is now, babies being born now, look at the controversy. We have all had controversies. But this is, because of technology, I feel, uh, so much more intense, immediate. How many five-year-old children have you seen with their heads down, heads down, looking at their phones? Five years old. This is how and what they are learning. So I just wanted to share that with you that many women are choosing now not to have babies because of what is pr unpredictably in the future. Mm -hmm. Yep. We can allow fear to guide our decisions for sure, um, but then we can also have faith and hope that our children can be beacons of light in a world that's growing darker. We're not perfect parents and we do make mistakes, but as is, has been with our relationship, we believe that if the intention is right and is there, that some fruit will be yielded, right? But only time will tell, so I gotta be brave. I'm just gonna say that a feminism starts with a given that what you're doing out in the world, trying to become a CEO or an important job, is more important than what is in the house. That is untrue to begin with, whether there's kids or not kids. It's every the building of relationships, the making of beauty. If it's just bringing, you know, putting flowers on the table, yes. of you know, creating food, cooking, nurturing people, whether they're old or young. The giving of the heart is every bit as important as, you know, rising to power or whatever it is. Right. And that's what the feminists miss. 
And, uh, you know, we, I do work on a website called Feminist Fallacy, and I just ask you to check it out and see what's there. Yeah, thank you. Are you one of our speakers this evening? No. Okay. No. Well, thank you. You know, I, I do want to make a comment for the future audience that may see this, that I drank the Kool-Aid completely. I was told to be a superstar, and all, we were five sisters, and we all did it. But my thing <laughs> is, I, on, I did not know until I went to this conference last year that a geriatric pregnancy is 35. I literally yeah. believed, at, when I married at 43, that because I saw Hollywood people yeah. conceiving and <laughs> birthing, that it wasn't a problem. So when it didn't happen for me, I called all my friends, I said, I know this may be offensive, drop everything you're doing and get pregnant. <laughs> and they did. I said, don't make this mistake. Yeah. You need to get pregnant. Oh, I love it. <laughs> make women pregnant again. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanna thank you guys for being here. Um, I'm gonna cry, but I was like that too. I, at 24, got married to a beta, beyond beta, <laughs> and I controlled everything he did, and I, I said jump, he said how high, and two, two years later I was like, all right, this is stupid, I'm gonna leave. Just did my own thing for a couple years, completely messed myself up, and then met this bearded redneck in Walmart shorts, and Perfect. completely my opposite. Um, yeah. And you know, for seven years, it's been a struggle for me to relax and become a woman and calm down. And when he started following you, I was like, here we go. Here comes this crazy, I don't know even what to call you, but you know, now amazing. But I was like, great, here we go. I'm just gonna listen and follow along. And I was like, this man is insane. He is aggressive. He is everything a that I'm not man. used to. Yes. But now I want to thank you because <laughs> I am now married to an amazing man because of people like you. So thank you so yeah. much. You're Ike's wife? That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. If I could just um, kind of speak to that, I, I, I often hear women say, like, you know, how do you yield so easily? How do you just give in to the feminine and let your, your man lead? How do you, they use the word submit, how do you, um, how do you just step back and let him lead? And I say, well, for me, that's my natural tendency. For me, it's very natural and easy for me to step back and let him lead. But I liken it to the fact of the same way there are many women that are like these career-driven alpha women that are strong and independent, it would be really, really difficult for me to do that. It's really, really difficult for me to be up here on stage speaking in front of people. That is not my nature. Um, and so the same way it takes time to practice being strong and, and kind of, you know, making, making choices and um, kind of trying that out is the same way that it takes time and practice to yield into your femininity for some women. And I, I think it's okay. I think it's okay that there are different types of women, the women that are easily um, led and, and women that are more like leaders. But I think it takes practice in both directions that, that if you are more of a leader and more of a, uh, a strong type woman, Give yourself grace, give yourself time, be patient with yourself and just practice it and, and enjoy the experience of, of allowing a good man to lead you. Um, it takes time to build faith, it takes time to build trust, but the more you practice it, if you have a good man, the, the easier it becomes and then it's, it's so pleasurable, it's so pleasurable to, to allow a good man to lead you and to be able to relax into that, that energy of, of just flow. I too am a divorced woman. I married my husband at the age of 47. We will be married 18 years this coming Monday. He, uh, talked to him yesterday said that he is driving to Germany on Sunday he's not here that's okay 
I've been through I just have to accept situations. And I think that that is something that some women have difficulty in uh, allowing the man to be the leader, is to just say, I accept. Women have a hard time accepting, sometimes, I feel. Now, Jean is who I married, French, Canadian. Men's uh, society, I do go for brilliance. And, um, but you know what? It was a different culture. A different culture, yes, I lived, I, I was in Montreal, lovely, beautiful place. I had um, very, I was very fortunate <coughs> because I was a career woman. And um, yes, I was able to, um, for the first job I had, a college approached Jean to teach. I, I, I can't, but my wife can. I had no pedagogical skills at all, right? But I had been a meeting planner in Washington, D.C. So, oh, okay, that was a learning experience for me, beautiful. And I'm not going to take much more of your time, but just to tell you, then the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and so forth and all. Oh. So, yes, I did have a uh, lovely life. Um, now, what I wanted to bring forward is this. Now, marrying into a different culture. It happens every, every day, a different culture. And it's that having to blend, which is very difficult to do. So therefore, there may be women out there with babies who are divorced because of such differences. Hey there. Hi, I'm Maria. I wanted to put an exclamation point and a gratitude for what you just shared just prior is um, about some women being a certain way and some women being another way. You know, uh, the Bible talks about to thine own self be true, right? And so in women that are discovering themselves, I just want to highlight that it is important to self-reflect and honor your true nature and to decipher what has been culturally driven and what is really within you. And so if you are, my mother was stay at home with four children and she loved every minute of it. And my true nature was different. I have children also and I tried to stay home and I was going to shoot myself. <laughs> Meaning that I'm a better mom with a diversity of a schedule of being there and not there, although I created a career so I could be home working from home, um, so I could be there for the little moments and the big moments and to be able to design my schedule around theirs. There are some women that can't have children, and the last thing I want them to hear in this message is if you aren't able to, then something has been lost in your life, and I don't, I don't think that's your message. I want to just highlight that if you can't have children and something happens, you can still have a beautiful space to give and birth in different ways and maybe adopt and maybe not. I agree. But there are a lot of places to give and mother. Mm -hmm. And as far as uh, submission and control, uh, for a woman, when she is awakened to the masculine energy and a masculine is awakened to secure masculine energy, I would hope that he highlights understanding that leadership has to be earned and not automatically given. The trust has to be established. And when a woman decides to submit, it's a gift. And when she doesn't, if she feels an anxiousness in her body and she's doing it anyway, that means you're being controlled because you're doing it against your will. But if you are going, wow, yes, please do that, that's submission, and there's a difference. She yeah. says that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're out of time here. We really appreciate you guys and your input, your questions.
Thank you very much. We appreciate you and the beauty. We appreciate the beauty. <laughs> Thank you. We can win this war. We can win this war. OK, well, joining us from Orlando, Florida, is the man in that clip, Anthony Dream Johnson, who says he wants to abolish feminism and make women great again. No, but it also crazy. says, with a trademark, make women great again. Full women are always great. great. Right. Make women great again. But they're going to do a three-day seminar for women led by all men. <laughs> in mansplaining news, a three-day conference for women led by men hopes to make women great again. How the 22 convention will make you the greatest you ever. Raise your femininity by 500%. First of all, how is a man supposed to tell a woman how to be the ultimate woman? But women need to be taught how to be great again. Oh, Not my yes, words. We do. Like how to land a husband, <gasps> how to lose weight, how to pop out a bunch of kids. Why do men think they need to fix the problems of women? Well, it says the world's ultimate event for women. In Orlando, Florida, that's going to be the scene of the crime. It's mansplaining palooza and say no to the toxic bullying feminist dogma. <laughs> Taught by men to make women great again. Taking the stage now is the founder of the 22 Convention. You're in for a treat, Mr. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. The first president of the Manosphere. It's run by all men, Surprise. which promises to, quote, make women great again. This course is guaranteed to raise your femininity by 500%. Together, we will make women great again. Excuse me, I'm mansplaining here. She said there's nothing...